Hi, everyone, and welcome to Black Lives Matter and Personal History in the Gallery and on Stage. I'm Janet Rose, the Interim Department Head of the Theater Arts Department. Last February, we recorded a streamed reading of Personal History, Dominic Taylor's play, which follows an African-American couple as they navigate three moments in American history of the 20th century in Chicago. Our reading was directed by guest artist Stanley Coleman. And we decided when we were choosing our back to the theater 2021-22 season, we want to do a full production of personal history and have Dr. Coleman direct it also. At about the same time, the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art was announcing the future exhibit of Black Lives Matter. Our department head, Dorte Osmeyer, suggested to Professor Michael Nizar that theater arts and the museum should get together and put on an event and a discussion that brought together the play and the exhibit. And here we are. I wanna take this moment to advertise that personal history will open in January 21 in the Hope Theater. And thanks to the College of Arts and Sciences for the Dean's Diversity Grant, which helps support our production. And now I'm gonna throw it over to John Weber, Executive Director of the Schnitzer Museum of Art. Uh, thank you, Janet. And um, many thanks to Dorte Osmeyer and Michael Najar from Theater Arts for, as Janet said, initiating this program. And also thanks to Dr. Stanley Coleman, who's directing Personal History for both helping to lead tonight's talk and for shaping it. Um, my thanks to the cast members of Personal History who are here. Uh, Julian, Chantral, and Kate, and to the artists um, from the museum's Black Lives Matter grant program exhibition, uh, Jasmine, Maya, uh, Malik, and John. And also, um, we are, we're hoping we'll be hearing tonight from um, Professor Taylor of UCLA. Uh, we're going to start the evening with a look at the museum exhibition, and I'm going to show some images from it as a background, and then we'll have around 20 minutes of discussion between the artists on their work and ideas. Then Dr. Coleman will introduce a reading from the play, Personal History, and um, after that we'll be doing some more um, discussion about it and commentary. So um, we are Looking forward, this is kind of an experimental program. We thought it would be interesting to speak with um, creators who are involved in both performing arts and theater and with the visual arts and see what kind of ideas uh, move back and forth. So now I'm going to screen share and quickly give you a sense of the, uh, the show. So if the, if the internet, God's all, all bless us. So this is the entry to the exhibition and you're seeing work by John Adair on the left and Gabriel Barrera on the right. Now the show um, was, it's a Jordan Schnitzer Family Foundation project and it was initiated and funded by Jordan of Portland to amplify artists' voices in Oregon and Washington in support of Black Lives Matter. Jordan has, he's a major art collector and he has collected uh, work in depth by black artists for more than 20 years. And he felt it was important for artists in our region to have a chance to, to speak out and he wanted to amplify their voices. Uh, collaborating institutions were the family foundation that he has and the JSMAs of the University of Oregon, Portland State University and Washington State University. And each institution awarded 20 grants of $2,500 uh, funded by Jordan Schnitzer. Um, here, we partnered with uh, the Black Cultural Center and I worked with um, Eris Hall on, on the project from the beginning. And together we put together, we put together a grant panel, including um, Eris, Dean Sabrina Madison Cannon of the UO School of Music and Dance, Jamar Bean from the UO Multicultural Center, and Jovencio de la Paz of the art department at the U of O. And they selected, together with me, selected the artists. Um, 
I'll do, um, uh, look through the show and introduce the four artists. Um, John Adair, this is his work, is a student and visual storyteller. He began as a photographer in 2008 and with the changing industry has grown his skills to include video. After migrating from Kansas to the Pacific Northwest, he's gone back to school to enhance his abilities. And with this series, Black and Gold, being one of the bodies of work that came from that decision. Um, on the left there is work by Malik Lovett. Um, he came to the university as an arts loving football player uh, who majored in fine arts, specializing in painting and drawing. After graduation, he did a master's degree in educational leadership at Northern Arizona University, then eventually came back to Eugene. Since then, he's been involved with a number of creative projects in art and education, including working with um, high school students on a, a project about monuments and on a portrait project here at the U of O. He's now enrolled in the U of O's master's degree program in architecture, and he's a member of the JSMA's Leadership Council um, Education Committee. Uh, Jasmine Jackson has a video on um, the left there, and that is um, a Stormy True's work on the right. And uh, Jasmine Jackson is a Black, queer, and non-binary creative who loves to produce vulnerable stories through video. They make work that challenges the discomfort of viewers, as their work often boldly centers marginalized communities, some of which make up the intersections of their own identity. With intersectionality being the forefront of their work, they hope for it to serve as a comfort to viewers who share intersections with the stories they produce. And for those who are made uncomfortable, they suggest leaning into that discomfort. My Lansing is a linguistics German double major inspired by scores of live streamers who document, documented the emotion, energy, and humanity of the Black Lives Matter movement. She photographed live streamers and others during sometimes chaotic protests in Portland and Washington, DC. She says, I felt a calling to make a difference in the world and spread God's light through creative outlets he's provided. Faith has been my most wonderful guide throughout my journey in photography and activism, and I'm excited to see where it takes me in the future. And here's a couple of other shots from the show. Uh, Michael Malloy on the right, um, Mo Wo, uh, on uh, ahead, the paintings. Um, there's a Mowo painting. Is an artist from um, Bend. Uh, Michael Malloy is from Junction City and doing a workshop right now on campus with dance. And that is um, Anthony Lewis uh, ahead. And here is Marina Hajek and Josh Sands. Now I'm going to pass things along to um, Malik to start us off with a question for John. Yeah, um, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. I thank everybody that's attending as well tonight. Uh, it's, it's truly an honor, and especially with being able to have the, each of us have a little bit of recognition uh, post-exhibition. And uh, as John has mentioned, I'll start off the artist panel with Ines, where we'll ask a few questions about each other's work. So the first question I'll ask, first of all, I'd like to say, John, fabulous work. It's it was one of the works that I got to uh, get introduced before I even got to submit my work and, and it inspired me truly. So the question I have for you is, um, you said that you had some lengthy conversations within, uh, within a few individuals family-wise. So I wanted to ask uh, of those stories or conversations that you had, which one impacted you the most and why? Well, uh, first off, thank you uh, very much for the, the kind words. Um, I think the story that stuck with me most was um, I definitely one, uh, the one involving my nephew because he's, well, at the time of his racial experience, racist experience, he was only 10 years old. So it really, um, it shocked me how early he'd already begun to experience that. But um, at the same time, it, wasn't that shocking to me as well because I had also experienced something at that age as well. Um, but overall, I think a story told by my dad was one that definitely stuck with me a lot. He, he recalled a time when he was in his teens back in St. Louis and he was talking to um, uh, his friends and they were um, 
we were walking down the street in the middle of downtown and um, just hanging out, minding their own business, when uh, a white man had come up to them and started yelling at them, calling them the N-word and told them that they needed to get out of there. And apparently the day prior, in that exact same spot that they were standing in, there was a group of black men in a car who had a Molotov cocktail thrown at them. And so it was just really like uh, an intense experience for him to be told that by somebody who had just referred to him by a racial slur. And it was just like, um, uh, I don't know. It, it was, um, it painted my dad's past in a different light because growing up with him, he, he went to the military to escape that environment and so he gave me the ability to grow up in a suburban neighborhood but um, unfortunately even being in a suburban neighborhood I still had racial experiences uh, thrown my way as well that were in similar light and even being in a nicer neighborhood than when he grew up in I'd still been called the n-word by strangers as well so his one his was definitely one that that stuck out a lot Right. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I have a, a question for yours. Um, I, I really enjoyed your body of work in, um, in tackling the idea of, of Black people needing to be athletic to be successful. That's something that is um, part of the Black culture. It's very deeply woven in. And um, I noticed that in your artist statement, you referred to the dichotomy between the internal and external perspectives. And I couldn't help but uh, relate the layout of your display as being a direct reference to that aspect of your work. And so I, I um, have a two-part question. The first being, emotionally speaking, what was the hardest about coming up with your concept? And in addition to that, what was the hardest about the actual creation process? Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. So um, emotionally, I would say it was more of, um, it was vulnerability for sure on my end of being able to express the side of myself and then having to truly reflect on my life of like basically carrying this weight of always being labeled as an athlete and even my own family members kind of caught into this um, frame of mind that that was my only way to make it out of where I was from originally so that was all that was definitely one of the harder parts of being able to overcome the fact of like well one how am I going to express this but then being able to essentially just lay all my pain out on this wall and being able to have people look at me good or bad because I have gotten a lot, I've gotten good and bad um, reflection or uh, overview of the project itself of like, are you sure you want to do this? Like, do you think this is, this is right? Like you're an alumni. I'm like, well, yes, but it's, it's the truth. It's the reality. And more so it's my self-expression of who I am. And that's a notion that no one can take away from myself or any of us as artists. So that was more my, um, I would say that was probably the biggest thing of just being able to be like, all right, I have this opportunity to finally express this story and how am I going to do it? And what's the purpose and to kind of add to the purpose. And it was trying to keep this conversation going and keeping and getting other athletes more importantly even teammates I have that are still on the football team currently at U of O and getting them to kind of see themselves in a different light on top of seeing myself in a different light and then putting us in this mindset to be like who are we outside of our jersey number and then in regards of the the project itself uh whether you believe it or not I actually set up that entire um I was actually staying with a family friend out in Coburg for the early, uh, the first half of this year, just to be able to make this project happen. And I had to set up the backdrop and place the, uh, and generally set the, the entire um, composition itself by having 
literally having that uh, one little uh, tennis racket hang by a plastic pin just to a backdrop. So I, there were so many little things I had to do myself and I was reaching out to friends and I had this bigger concept of wanting to get them involved to really document every process. But as time kept going on, the deadline was coming closer. I had to kind of formulate a project itself. So I had to basically prop up the camera myself, get the perfect composition. And then I luckily bought one of those cheap, um, uh, what do you call it? Tripods from Amazon where you can utilize uh, like the clicker to basically, it's like, a, it's like a, essentially like a self timer, but you can click it. So I basically would just put myself in different, I frame myself, I put myself in different positions and just kept clicking and clicking. And then I'd have to run to my laptop, airdrop the photos, look at them, see which one I like on top of keeping everything to stay on the backdrop because I had a little pin that would hold the, even the old football uh, helmet and the tennis. Um, and then on top of that, I was, I had a limited camera in regards of its span of what can be captured. So I had to make it a really tight fit to make sure I captured every little component that I wanted within the frame. So that was probably the hardest part of trying to get the, having to take the actual picture myself. Great, and we've got time. Um, Malik, if you've got another question for John, we've got time for that. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, it's kind of similar to the question of what you just asked me, because I don't necessarily know how to ask it. I've been thinking about it all day on like how I could formulate this question, but I wanted to know if there was some form of correlation of like a kind of an internal external perspective for you going through the process. Cause I think you mentioned that you ripped up the photo. So like I envisioned like, was there, was there a moment of like anger when ripping up these photos and reflecting on these stories and then being able to conjoin them? So like, I guess I wanted to ask as well, like what was the hardest part for you throughout the process emotionally and the actual creation itself? Um. Emotionally, it was hearing my family members' stories and uh, coming to terms with the facts that I didn't really know as much about them and their past as I had hoped. And that was actually part of the, uh, the reason why I even chose to um, cover this over my family members was because of uh, the lack of knowledge of what was going on in their lives. And so um, it was it was definitely hard to to be reaching out to these family members who I hadn't like personally spoken to in like months or years and then to go in and talk about some of the um, some of these really harsh situations that they've had to deal with. and um, and then, some of the conversations that spurred off of that as well, such as um, uh, the conversation I have with my sister, who isn't um, up there. Uh, I have like, I have four other images that aren't on display, but one of them is of my sister and she and I had probably the deepest conversation that spurred from racism into family and how we were raised in our environment. And so that was uh, a real eye opener because it, it began to piece together certain aspects of my personality and, and where I came from. And, um, and then as I was tearing this, I was uh, listening to each individual conversation that I had with everyone. And so every time, um, uh, I made a tear was during a point in the audio recording where we spoke about one of their experiences. Mm -hmm. Great. Wow, that's fantastic. I had no idea that you were simultaneously listening as you were essentially creating the project. That's that's a pretty very rare and yet like really cool process. Like really cool, man. It's awesome. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Let's move now to um, Jasmine. I think you've got a question to start up with Maya. Hi, Maya. Um, one, I was super impressed to see just what seemed like a multiple mediums in one to tell one whole story. Um, I've never really seen someone piece together um, collaging um, mixed with 
uh, black and white photography and then having just different sorts of mediums to tell one big story. Um, so that's one acknowledgement I want to say. And my, my question is kind of a buildup. So um, I was curious, I think when I looked at the portraits split between the two and um, I loved the concept of splitting like this human behind the mask idea um, because I think that it humanizes the people that were in the protests and involved. And then I also had a question, I think, related to um, the choice in style, I think, because I've heard critiques of black and white photography and how it's been used as a reference of documented history, particularly black history, which allows for us as viewers um, to think of this history and the prevalent issues that are being portrayed as issues of so long ago when we see it in black and white as opposed to color. Um, when in fact that civil rights era wasn't that long ago and injustice, injustices then are injustices that are still present today. So I guess my question is, what are your thoughts on capturing black history and black and white given the controversy surrounding black and white imagery in relation to black history? Thank you for that question. I think you bring up a lot of good points and I thought when I was using black and white, it was mainly because in colored pictures, uh, a lot of times the focus is taken off of what's happening and the finer details because there's so much color um, in your face. And so in the black and white, I thought it was like an emotional touch where you just see a different side of the pictures. And I didn't even consider the, like that type of stuff. And so I think it's interesting and um, I definitely wanted to capture a different side of like what's happening today and the people that are out there today. And it differs a lot from back then, how protesting and the different, it's still very dangerous and there's a lot to show. And so I really appreciate your question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Maya, I, question for, for Jasmine? Yes, I have a question for you. So um, throughout the video, I saw a theme of growth and your resilience through like the discomfort of these trying times that we've been going through. And it made me think like in some ways we have come a long way, but obviously there's still a lot of work to be done. And I was wondering if you maybe had like an idea about a way that <clears throat> society can commit to disarming the present structures that are compromising marginalized communities well-being instead of like the performative participation that we've seen from many privileged groups like you mentioned um like the black squares that people will post on social media and like we're not going to applaud you for that type of stuff so I was wondering what your take was on that for me I I was a one, I want to say that I was a mix of emotions, like a cluster of emotions in 2020 summer. And that's where you hear a lot of um, my narrative is tone wise, it seems very angry and that I was very much. Um, and I think that <laughs> above all of the emotions, that one was the most angering. Um, and I mean, what led me to like beginning this project was because I felt so many emotions while also being checked in on for some people's first time ever checking out in on me. And so being black in 2020, it just changed all the discourse and how people approached you and what people decided to bring forth and talk to you about. And so for me, I didn't want anything besides you to put your money forth. <laughs> like to put it frank, I think that that is the very least that I think that was the most comforting in 2020 for any black persons that there was because I can sit and provide all these solutions to history that's been ongoing that people are just now paying mind to in 2020 or just now registering to a very much reality that we don't get to take a break from nor do we get a break to be educated about our own history we're born into that sort of history and um, that's our reality so no one teaches us that we're black. We know that we're we're made aware that we're black very fast um, upon being born. And so 
for me, I don't have any solutions besides cough up your coin. Um, that's for artists, <laughs> that's for educators and people that choose to educate because I found that a lot of black folks were in positions where despite not being paid as an educator or a teacher professor, what have you, they still were placed in the positions where people are asking questions like, so what do you think the next step is? Or how do you think that we can care for you or you as a black person or you, your community as a whole? And that's a lot to ask a black, a, a black person to, you know, like answer when you have to consider everything before you, everything present day, and then where you anticipate as a black person as going. And then you're like stumped too with your sort of positionality too, not only as like a black person, but then you add all these other intersections like being a black artist and like the way you're being di like digested. And, and you know, I, I noticed that um, I had, I think I felt like I got a lot of solution questions when I felt like black folks should just be getting results at this point. So if, to be frank, my biggest answer is probably just if it doesn't look like cash shopping, bin mowing, and literal reparations in a monetary sense. I didn't think that there was any other way to support a system that seems to um, be continuous in its ways to oppress and suppress our voices, existence, lives, et cetera. So I hope that was a good enough extensive answer. <laughs> yes, thank you. You brought up a, good, a lot of good points. Thank you so much. And Jasmine, if you've got another uh, question for Maya, go for it. Um, so there is a lot of people, obviously, as prote protesting um, this past 2020. And so I'm curious, um, how did you go about who to document and when to document them? And yeah, what was your sort of process with that? Well, I just went out to like local protests in Eugene at first, and I didn't really record at first. I was just kind of walking by, like following the group. And then I started becoming more confident. And then I wanted to document what was happening because it seemed like things were going bad really fast and a lot of unfair treatment was starting to happen. And so I learned like when to be documenting and who to document and like there were direct actions and that type of stuff. So I was mainly just trying to document the police and then attend events that were happening in the day to show like a more lighter side of the protests and different type of um, actions that were happening throughout the movement. So it was hard, it was hard. And I learned there were times definitely not to film and uh, places to avoid, at least for my comfort levels. But a lot of people were nice and welcoming and it was a safe environment for the most part. So thank you. And Maya, if you got one more for Jasmine, that'd be great. Then we'll move to the play. Okay. And I was wondering, um, I really like the style you did with like the lips and the eyes. I was wondering what was your inspiration behind that? Yes. So <laughs> I, I had a lot of thoughts throughout the creative process with this because originally I didn't even name it the scary truth. I named it, well, for anyone that's not familiar with AV in here, African-American vernacular English, um, there's black folks say like, what's the tea? And that's like the, what's the latest scoop? What's the, what's the gossip, what's going on? And so originally the, process, the project was called, what's the quarantine? Qu quarantine party, it was like a tea party. And then I was like, this is just way too extensive for people to get. Then I'm about to do some breakdown for AV and I'm like not doing, trying to do all that. So um, I was like, well, when am I releasing this and putting, putting this out? And it was actually on Halloween day. And I was like, how interesting would it be to just have this floating eyes and like mouth? One, because like visually that just looks like different to people. And then having the words like wave out, like you're listening to this like black queer non-binary, like ghost essentially giving you the tea and like just like I mean it's it's the message I feel like it's just me really tone wise is like infuriated bothered annoyed and so I'm like I want this message to scare you um I don't want to be digestible and I don't want to be palatable because 2020 hasn't given black folks the room to be given palatable and digestible content when we're seeing our people being killed every day you know so um that was kind of the concept so it's kind of like a 
a ghost and um it has very much to do when i released the project because it was on halloween Great, thank you. Well, thanks to thank you all, all of you for your work in the show and for sharing your ideas with us tonight. And um, we do have uh, the shows on view for another week and a half through November 21st. So anyone who's listening hasn't seen it yet, please come to the museum. And we also have a virtual tour accessible through our website and it has Jasmine's video on it and it has the artist statements and, and lots more. And now I'm happy to turn things over to Dr. Stanley Coleman. Thank you, John. And good evening to everybody. Uh, Professor Dominic Taylor has written the play Personal History, which follows an African-American couple through di three different moments in American history. The first being in 1903, the second 1953, and the third in 1996. And we watch their relationship change as they meet different social circumstances through each of these moments. The University of Oregon Theater Arts Department will present this play during the upcoming winter term. The play's cast includes Julian Sneed, Chantral Turner, Ethan Heckman, Navon Incarnacion, Ari Rubinstein, and Kate Smith. And this evening, Julian, Chantral, and Kate will read a scene from the 1950s section of the play in which the Negro couple has just bought the finest house in a white neighborhood. And who shows up at their door but a white housewife from the neighborhood. So let's take it away, cast members. So whose house is this, Mrs. Ballsweed? This is the Ballsweed house. And who are the Ballsweeds? The Ballsweeds are we. <laughs> uh, yes. When is the rest of the stuff coming? Friday or Saturday? Uh, Saturday. Did you call the movers yesterday? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, this is ours. We can do what we want here. Look at this house, baby. It's not just a house. It's the biggest house on the most beautiful block. And everything here is just, you know, we might have to buy new furniture. Wait, wait, new furniture? I forgot about the window, the front room, the way everything just glows. We need another color. We can't have the old furniture in here. Whoa, whoa, baby, we, we can't get any new furniture. I know we can't get it now, but I'm saying we should get it sometime before too long, before the children come. Whoa, 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 whoa. you're not. Not yet. Remember, we had to buy the house before we had the four children. Wait, I thought it was two. Two boys and two girls. Now, if we only have two children, we're not increasing the number. We're just keeping it the same. Three then. If we have three, two of which boys or girls, see, it's just easier. Two and two. Anyway, we need to get some new things, especially for these two rooms. You see how the light just dances through the window? I see how the light dances on you. Oh, Jean. <laughs> I, I, I lied to you not. <laughs> you look like a cup of iced tea on a warm summer's day. Huh, now don't be playing. I am playing, woman, I swear. You're lucky to be my wife. Well, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, if I wasn't your husband, I had to kill the man that was your husband. You're so silly. Well, I remember the last time you wore that dress. Election day. I remember why you wrote, wore it in the first place. I didn't have a reason. Well, you figured who, who could deny you anything in that dress? I just wanted to vote. Well, you figured, okay, follow all the rules, bail your ducks in a row, and then just in case they try to block you, you figured, well, I'm in this dress. They might want to stop me, but they wouldn't stop you in this dress. No, this is a dress of opportunity. God brings you many opportunities if you pray. Mm-hmm. 
That's why we gotta go to church. Well, we can go to the old church. Too far. We can take the car. Are you gonna come with me? Well, I'll drive you there and pick you up. What's the matter with you and church? Nothing's the matter with church. You just don't go. Right. You and God have a disagreement. Well, me and the minister have a disagreement. But it's God's house. Well, I, I know it's God's house. It's just this tent I ain't too strong on. Jean, but you agree. We need a church near us. Yeah, I agree. It's like having a grocery store. Well, the, you know, the window will give us a sign. The feeling ain't the same. Yeah. Well, we still have to hear. Well, I know. I know. Yeah. We need to figure this out. Well, you know, we still have the other church. But what we need is insurance. What happened to the insurance? Well, insurance companies aren't used to covering a house this big. You just went to the colored companies. Well, I wanted to be insured by a colored company, but they've never insured a house this large in a non-colored neighborhood. Did you try any white companies? Well, I, I don't know any. Okay, I, I wanted to stay with our old insurance company. Well, we have to get the house insured. We will. Because I love this house. And I love you. And I love you. Can you believe it? Sometimes, don't you think we must be dreaming? I woke up last night and I looked at you. I looked around the room. I tried to figure out how this happened. I was asking the Lord, where did you come from? Mississippi. Where did this house come from? Why are we so happy? Well... We work hard and we love each other. What is it that makes our love so bright, like that window? Well, we have high hopes. Really high. Higher than any other color people. You know, when we wanted to move, we didn't want to move into just any house. We wanted to move into the most grand house in all of Chicago. Most people, specifically color, just wanted to move into a white neighborhood. We expect better. Uh, and we expect great things. So great things happen to us. Don't other colored people expect great things? Well, I, I know what I expect. I, I know what I do. I know that my position is mine. I have my wife and I have my home. That is not what I was promised. It's what I worked for. It's what we both worked for. Without a doubt, what we both worked for. All we need to do is find a church and we can... Hello. Hello. Is the lady of the house home? She is. May I speak to her? You are. Myrtle is right. I'm sorry, who's Myrtle? She lives next door. Oh, she plays peekaboo with the curtains. I know who she is. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Mrs. McCabe, and I live across the street. And you are? Mrs. Ballsweed, Miss Bethany Ballsweed, and that's my husband, Mr. Ballsweed. Eugene Ballsweed. Hello, ma'am. Hello, sir. Sir? Well, oh, well, I represent the Block Association, and... Well, if you will excuse me, Mrs. McCabe, I'll be upstairs if you need anything. Nice to meet you. I'm sure. Well, I represent the Block Association, and, well, we just like to know who our neighbors are. We like to let them know what our standards are for the Block. I'm sure you can appreciate someone trying to maintain a positive community. Absolutely. I think the neighborhood is charming, and needless to say, we love this house. The house is magnificent. How did you obtain this wonderful house? The same way you obtained yours. Your father gave it to you. That's how you obtained your house? Oh, yes. I was born into it. Then we got married, and Mom and Dad passed it to us. Where are Mom and Dad now? Florida. We bought it. Really? What does your husband do for a living? He owns a few pharmacies in the city. Really? Where? What does your husband do? He works for the city. 
That's nice. This is an awfully big house. Do you have any children? Not yet. You don't? Well, what do you do all day? I work. Do you do domestic? I own a few businesses, but they aren't on this block. You own a business? Does a block association want biographies from me and my husband? No, don't be silly. Well, at first we wanted to know who bought the house. Now that we know you bought it. Yes, we bought it. Actually, dear lady, I don't think anyone on the block association anticipated that. Would there be a reason for you to anticipate it? A point. Aren't your children missing you? Myrtle is watching them. Great. Well, what kind of events does the Block Association do? We do a variety of things, and we can do a lot more. Really? Do you ever have bake sales? We have in the past. Why, would you like to bake for us? Actually, I wanted to buy a pie. Buy a pie? Well, not a whole pie, just a piece of it. Well, I have met you and your husband. So you have. And if you have nothing else? No, I have nothing else. Oh, Miss McCain, do you go to church? Why, of course. Where do you go to church? Well, I, I go to Mount, Car Mount, Car Mount Carmel. That's the church just a few blocks away. What kind of church is it? It's a, uh, well, it's a... Uh, is it a Baptist church? No, Catholic. Good, thanks for the welcome. Yes. Have a nice day. Oh, yes. See you Sunday. Okay, thank you <laughs> uh, to the students for this presentation. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure you can see that uh, we've got some conflicts already starting. Uh, in this uh, play. Uh, actually, uh, there's been earlier conflict and uh, we're just, we're now in 1953 and the conflict has uh, gotten a bit broader. Um, we're very pleased to have with us tonight the esteemed playwright of personal history, Professor Dominic Taylor. Professor Taylor is a writer, he's a director and a scholar of African-American theater whose plays have been performed all over the United States. He is presently on the faculty of the Department of Theater, Film and Television at UCLA. He is the former associate artistic director of the Penumbra Theater Company in St. Paul, Minnesota, one of the premier African-American theater companies in the US. And while he was there, he developed his unique play development process called okra. And okra, a term meaning spark, a spark of life in Ghana is an opportunity to establish the distinct voice of the African-American community. Dr. Taylor, we've invited to speak a little bit about his play, Personal History, and maybe he'll uh, speak about various topics concerning race. And following his talk, we're going to open to a question and answer period. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dominic Taylor. Professor Taylor? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Coleman. I appreciate it. And the actors, you did a great job on the uh, challenging, complex, strange place. So um, I'm going to give you a little bit of the context for personal history. In 1995, I was living in Chicago and uh, Steppenwolf Theater asked me to write a play. They, they commissioned me to write a new play. And at the time, Steppenwolf Theater had one Black company member, K. Todd Freeman, who's a fantastic actor. And I was living in Chicago, of course, and I was trying to figure out ways in which I could look at Chicago, Chicago life, upper middle class, black people, a bunch of things. And I am a student of history. I, um, I went to Brown University. I studied, studied under George Houston Bass. And George Houston Bass uh, was a professor 
who engaged in this process called the research to performance method, which helped me develop some methodology. But the reason why I'm mentioning Professor Bass now is he's the first person to alerted me to the fact that history is right next to us. I think Jasmine mentioned something about history and, and, and all of the visual artists who work deals with history in so many ways. George Houston Bass was Langston Hughes's secretary at, at the end of his life. And I never forgot when George, there's a bunch of stories I could tell about George, but I never forgot when George showed me a letter between Langston and Zora Neale Hurston. And I remember thinking, you know, as an 18 year old, like, oh my gosh, I thought Langston Hughes was like in the ancient past. And I thought Zora Neale Houston was in the ancient past. And I had a letter between them and it humanized them and it made history come alive. And it made me think about a bunch of things in terms of how I dealt with history. So um, in terms of personal history, the play, uh, as I said, I got this commission from Steppenwolf. And then I started to think about where black people are and how we move through Chicago and Chicago's life cycle. So in 1903, uh, that's the beginning of the Niagara movement, which some of you might know as the beginning of the NAACP. 1953 is the year before Brown versus Board of Education. And that is, you know, also uh, a seismic racial moment. And uh, 1995, when I got the commission, was the middle of the OJ trial. So it's 1995 and 1996. And I actually finished it when the verdict came out, just before the verdict in 1997. So um, that's the reason why 1996 is, is, is that moment, these, these seismic racial moments. And one of the things I was playing with or toying with was, it's a conceit that can only happen in theater. You go 93 years of time. But what I said to the actors when we were messing with it in Chicago was, well, what if it's 93 months? Instead of 93 years, I don't want, I don't want a Miss Jane Pittman story. I don't need to have a, a hundred year old woman in the space, right? Or a man in the space. What if it's 93 months instead of 93 years? And that's a relationship of eight years about, seven point something years. And so what happens in the, in the course of the, for those of you who have seen the play or you will see the play, uh, in 1903, uh, Bethany and Eugene meet. And so in, the, in 1953, that's, you know, 50 months later, so to speak, or four years later, and they, they, you know, it's a heterosexual normative space for reasons that had to do with the way in which I constructed the play at the time. But, you know, they're a couple and they're married and they move into the grandest house in Chicago. And then in 1996, that grand house in Chicago is now a restaurant. Um, uh, I mean, it, it, it still goes on today, but there was a restaurant in Chicago um, that was in the, uh, it was called Des Joies, and it was owned by this New Orleans um, restaurateur and his mother. And it was, you know, it was a house that they converted into a restaurant. So that was the other piece of impetus. So it went from one person's home to another person's home to a commercial enterprise in, in the course of, of, of how the play got put together. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fun, challenging, uh, for the actors who messed with it, I think one of the things which is really hard and was hard when we were dealing with it in rehearsal is how Black-white relations shift in not just Ms. McCabe in 1953, in 1903, in Chicago, there were rules on the books in 1903 that if a black man walked on the sidewalk and a white woman was walking on the sidewalk in Chicago, he had to get off the sidewalk and get to the curb. Actually, that law stopped in Chicago in the 50s. That law still existed in uh, North Carolina in 1973 or so. I grew up in New Jersey. I had a good friend who was in North Carolina. So my only point is that race relations that we take as normal today, the normative moment, like you know, if I walk into my, uh, if I walk into a faculty meeting and, and, and I, I shake a white woman's hand, there is no threat to my life in that space. But if I went back a hundred years, that, that could be a death sentence. That could be a moment of, of, of everything being different. So that's one of the things that I'm toying with in personal history is like how these moments in our lives, how these moments in history and how we interpersonal beings change throughout the time. So it's a, it's a, it's a journey. I'm glad Dr. Coleman decided to do it. It's, it's, a, it's a play that's been done a couple of times and it's always a challenge because I think people are a little taken aback, particularly with the, with the, mom, the, the moments of conflict that emerge from the beginning of the play. Because in the beginning of the play, this is a man who comes up from Mississippi to Chicago and he comes up 
because it's 1903 and, and business has changed and reconstruction has changed things. So he was a pharmacist in Mississippi and he comes to Chicago. And when he comes to Chicago, he meets the white supplier distributor of, of his pharmaceutical company who doesn't want to deal with him. And then we get the 50s and then we get the 90s and you should see the play. But I think that gives you a frame of, um, you know, what my thinking was in terms of making the play. And, and uh, yeah, we can talk some more if anybody has any particular questions, but I hope that gave a framing of it. Um, I do think with the heels of the Black Lives Matter movement in, in, in all of our thinking and the visual art being part of it, the, our relationship to history is crucial to our progress. I mean, I think, I, I, I mean, our progress, I mean, in the micro or in the smaller cohort of black people, but I also mean in the progress of humanity. Um, I do think it's compelling for us to consider at the turn of the 20th century, we had black nationalism as this driving engine, whether or not we dealt with Marcus Garvey or, or, or and the UNIA movement. And in the 1950s, this is the beginning of the contemporary civil rights movement. And now we're in the, you know, the beginning of the 21st century and, and there's a strange acknowledgement of that we need to make sure that black lives matter. It's a compelling question and I don't have the answer to the question of whether or not that's progress or that's something else. I, um, I think that the, the, the challenge is personally or interpersonally it might be viewed as progress, i.e. 100 years from now they did not have a black man as a professor at UCLA, you know, today they do, however, um, I am the only African American tenured person in the theater program in, 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 in the largest school in Los Angeles. I mean, that's that's says something about, you know, you know, where progress situates and stuff. So I do think that history is an important piece for us. And that's the other thing. I I, I would like people to like go and re-examine our the times we live in and, and, and how we exist. And it's 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 really quite interesting that theater can be this vehicle that will allow it to happen, but oftentimes we don't. And I don't wanna tell a story about, um, it's a very long story, but it's part of the reason why I, I have, I was an engineering undergraduate and <clears throat> I took a class with George Bass and um, he introduced me to this play by William Wells Brown that was written in 1847. And it quite literally blew my mind. And, you know, as it's, the rest is history or the rest is whatever you wanna call it. But it was written by a free black man in 1847, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Like I, like my processing was like, I can't believe that that play exists, and uh, yeah, it changed everything in my life. Yeah. I hope I was clear. I see that things are. Could everybody hear me? We're okay. Mm -hmm. Dr. Coleman, did that answer some framing questions? Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Did that answer some questions about framing the work? That was what I said. Or, uh, or did, did I go in and out? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, I would, uh, well, I think uh, a couple of the uh, actors have a, a couple of questions maybe they wanted to ask you about uh, just to get some clarity uh, since they are uh, performing uh, this play. <laughs> Uh, and I think uh, we can start off. Uh, Kate, you have a question, I think. Yeah, I had a question about like the reoccurring theme of like the porter's hat in the show. And um, we were talking about this yesterday in rehearsal, um, but we just like to know um, what you think the significance of that hat is, especially when in the scene where um, Eugene and Bethany um, Bethany walks by and she knocks the hat off the table and then they have a moment of looking at it um, and Eugene picks it up. So we just wanna know um, what that means. We're curious about that. Yeah, so, yeah, so I will, so I, I, you, I hate to do this to you, Kate, the other actors can answer it. So what is the, so it's a porter's cap. So what is that, how does that work within the context of the play as a symbol of within the play? Like whose hat was it before? Whose hat was it before? Yeah, uh, Julian, who's, you, you were gonna say something. Whose hat was it? Um. <laughs> hey. It's Eugene's? Or, or where does, 
No, it's not. But where does it come from in terms of where we are in 1996 when it gets knocked off the table? Like, because now we're in contemporary times, right? Now we're in the contemporary times when it gets knocked off the table, correct? And they both look at it. What is the point? If you don't even want to think about it, you don't even have to think about the play. You could think about just being a porter. You could just think about being a porter, right? So a porter, for lack of a better word, is somebody. Yeah, somebody said, Julian, you were going to say something? What's a porter? Or who was a porter? Pullman porters. Wait, I don't know. I'm sorry? What, what, what are porters? What are the porters? Or who are they in terms of, and anybody can answer this. This is not just the act, this is anybody. Sleeping card porters, Pullman porters, um, Philip Randolph. People are like, I don't know. I've never heard of a porter before. It's been a porter, like um, <clears throat> basically like service, kind of kind of like the help. Right, the person who would carry your bags onto tr onto trains or you know trains or coaches. So it's the person who carries the bags. Now at this point, Eugene and Bethany are way past bag carrying. They are also in a restaurant with interracial people. They are no longer with black people. And now this porter cap brings them back to the past. It's like, wait a second. I, I mean, to, to think about subservient jobs. I'm not a domestic. I wasn't a shoeshine person. I'm not carrying anybody's bag. So when the hat gets knocked over, it is, um, it is a symbol to remind them of black progress. It's actually a symbol to remind them of black labor is what it is. And the fact that they, as individuals, and in that moment, Eugene, I'm taking stuff away from the play, Dr. Coleman, I'm sorry. But in the 1990s, Eugene is no longer with Bethany. Eugene is with a white woman and Bethany is with a white man, depending on where their relationship is, but they are no longer a black couple mm -hmm. because, the, because the, 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 the progress has decided to, 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 to make them go in different directions. So to answer the question about the Porter's hat, when they both look at it, it is that moment where my last name is Taylor not because I come from the coat of arms of the Anglo-Saxons, Taylor. My last name is Taylor because the person who owned my great-great-grandfather in Jamaica, his name was Taylor. So I have to embrace whatever you want to call it, but that's, you know, if somebody shows me, hey, Dominic, here's the coat of arms for the Taylors, it's like, well, that ain't my Taylors. Do you know what I'm saying? So when the, when the Porter's hat gets dropped, it's like, oh yeah, my dad had to come here with nothing and worked every job imaginable, <laughs> jobs I can't even imagine now, to send me to school. And the fact that like I can't even think about that as a possibility is part of the reason why they stare at it. Because it is the, 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 the discomfort, if I even want to use an overused term, the discomfort with Black positions in the past for present day Black people. I mean, one of the things which I think is always surprising to me is when, and I'm saying this to a group of young people, but young African-Americans look at the past and say, if I was Jackie Robinson, I wouldn't have put up with that stuff or whatever it is, fill in the blank person, right? And I'm like, no, no, you have to, we, those are superheroes. The porter is a superhero. The person who, the domestic, those are superheroes. Those are people who we just like, I can't believe that they did that. And, <laughs> and then they did all the other things. I have a friend of mine, she's a writer for the Washington Post. And her dad went to the University of Chicago Medical School in the 30s or the 40s. I can't even remember what year it was, but this is part of the thing. And when he got out of medical school in Chicago in the 40s, he could not get a job. So he worked as a janitor in the University of Chicago for 10 years. And he was always ashamed of it. And I was like, no, that's amazing. Like, that's amazing. Like, that's, that's better than I could ever imagine. And the thing that I want to bring people's attention to when they're staring at the hat that gets knocked over, or when they have the, the, the cognitive dissonance when they're looking at the red, white, and blue, of the Confederate flag or the United States flag, it's like, these are heavy things. And I think what, what ends up happening is it's very difficult for contemporary African-Americans to deal with some of, the, some of that, for lack of word, lack of better word, baggage of our past. And that's the reason why they stare at the hat. It's just difficult for them to deal with. Um, yeah. Right, uh, Dr. Taylor. So I've been telling the, the uh, actors that I believe that one of the themes that runs 
uh, through your play has to do with uh, remembering the past. And uh, I think that, uh, I think in some kind of way, there's an attempt by these characters to try to uh, distance themselves from the past. And I think, uh, I think, and, you know, for <laughs> trying not to give away too much of the play, I think that we are confronted with that issue uh, in the restaurant when mm -hmm. uh, Bethany has her epiphany, uh, epiphany moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the past is painful. I mean, the past is difficult to deal with. I mean, I, you know, I think it was John who was talking about his his parent or his his elders and them dealing with the past and and I think, I mean, you know, I take my my life as partially a model to what goes on. So I have I have an eleven year old son, and when I was in sixth grade, he plays basketball. I played basketball. I played basketball in college. He's over there. That's and I and I, he's got his headphones on, so he he probably will. He can't hear me, so he says. Anyway, <laughs> when I was in sixth grade, I went to a Catholic school. We playing basketball, and I was playing pretty well. Anyway, long story short, at the end of the game, a grown white woman spit on me, spit on me, and because I was playing well, and her son was on the other team, and I made him look bad or whatever. It don't make it don't make a difference. But my coach was furious. My coach went crazy, da 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 da. And I just stood there kind of frozen. I stood there kind of frozen and I wiped it off. And I remember looking at her like, you're a grown woman. Like I didn't even, like I didn't process it. I didn't process it as anything other than like an event that happened in 1976. And we had an oil embargo and all this other stuff was going on. And I remember thinking, I was like, wow, that's really kind of tripped out, you know? If that happened to my son today, I'm calling a lawyer. We're going, you know, I'm saying there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going to happen aside from fighting, right? There's a bunch of things that are going to happen, right? But at the time, I was like, yeah, that's like trippy. Like, I, tri I you know, I was a kid, you know, I didn't know anything. And so I think, I mean, even when I think about it, it's like, yeah, you know, you know, our past is a series of painful moments. And I think dealing with it is part of the reason why I took this, this 1996 couple. It's weird when we were rehearsing in Chicago, they said, which, which decade am I really in is one of the actors said. Am I in the 90s? Am I in 1903 and I'm imagining the 90s? Like, where am I? And I said, you're in all of those real places, like in that real time. And I do think that it's as unusual for, you know, the, the, the black people to deal with their painful past. It's unusual for, a while. I mean, you know, Kate, I don't even know you, but I'm sure you're not one of those people who'd walk into somebody's house and be like, excuse me, you black people aren't supposed to be here. Do you know what I'm saying? But, but, but it's 1953 and she's like, oh no, I don't, but they're in the best house in my neighborhood. Like you can't be in the best, it's 1953. You can't be in the best house. Aren't you supposed to go over to like, I don't know, some little house on the side, you know? But, but it's, it's weird. And I, and I do think that dealing with our history is part of the function of the play. I mean, I, I hope, I hope. And I do think that's one of the things that we have to deal with as humans to go forward. I think, I think it, is, it is sad and problematic that we don't want to deal either uh, individually or collectively with the complexity of American history. And this is not to say anything about any particular ways of dealing with American history, but I'm saying the complexities of American history are really, really, really problematic. And I do think one of the grand challenges about it is uh, the engine for America is free market capital or free market capitalism. And that's a thing that's inside this play too, like where, where we situate ourselves in terms of that idea, you know, where's money situated itself mm -hmm. for all of us, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Taylor. I, I'm gonna turn this over to John who may want to uh, uh, pose or get other questions from people or uh, uh, tie in some of the uh, work of the artist to some of the uh, meanings in this, in this play. Uh, 
I think you muted, John. I was so I was so riveted. Um, we're getting to to unmute. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Taylor. Um, we wanted to open it up to general questions now to the audience, but also wanted to encourage if any of the artists or uh, cast members have questions for each other or uh, for um, Professor Taylor, we'd welcome that sort of back and forth. Um, and if we've got questions, see if we get some questions coming in from, from the audience too, that would be great. We're gonna go probably for another, so we go maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes, just depending on how the energy goes. Um, I was struck and I, I think the history, is, history is such a huge thing. And I, I remember, you know, one of the things that's weird about um, the United States language is we say it's history to mean it, it's, it doesn't matter anymore. And the opposite is true. History is everything. History is, history is what made us. And, and so um, it's, that, that phrase has always struck me as very odd. Um, I was also struck, um, Professor Taylor, the, the uh, artist, um, Glenn Ligon did an interview at SF MoMA early in his career uh, with um, Thelma Golden. And he was talking, she asked him about um, dealing with slavery. And, you know, he's, you know, he's gone on to become a fabulously um, important uh, major artist, but he's in his, his about 36 or 37 at the point she asked him that. And he's, and his answer, which they still have online, is that um, I get asked, why do I deal with it? And roughly saying, people say, why do you bring up our shameful past? And it's not shameful. And if we don't deal with it, we will never move beyond it. It's, it is history and we have to, we have to um, stick with it. And um, so you're, you're um, talking about history reminded me of, of, that, of that video. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, and one of the things, and this is a, um, and this goes to some of the visual, this goes to everyone. I've been very lucky in my life to have had physical contact with people who have moments in history. And I think we can do more of that. Like individually, collectively, it's, you know, when, when, when Malik shows me the, um, uh, Fritz Pollard on the upper left on his piece and Althea Gibson. Althea Gibson was in my neighborhood and we drove past her and my dad stopped the car. She was pushing a cart. She's pushing, a, she's coming from the grocery store. And I remember I was like, that's Althea Gibson? Like, no way, the greatest female athlete of all time is walking down a street in East Orange, New Jersey. I lived in Orange. She was walking down the street and we got out the car and I was like, oh my God, you know, like, oh my God. That's Althea Gibson. And she didn't need any help. And, you know, my dad talked to her for a second. But it's the fact that, like, we have these people who we can reach in our family, in, outside of our family, who have lived these unbelievable lives, who we can keep, hopefully, reaching out to and finding and growing with our, with our collective past, our collective mm -hmm. past. That's all. We, we've got a couple questions from the audience here. Here's um, one. Um, Emma Maltz, in terms of personal history, why do the characters hang and keep the flag up. We talked about this in rehearsal as well, but I'd like to hear what you have to say about it. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the flag is a symbol of, um, when it comes through the stained glass window, which, you know, stained glass windows have all this other stuff um, available to them. Uh, I think Eugene's first line, or maybe it's Bethany's line, is that this stone this was not made by uh, straw. This was sewn into the fabric of America. And that's the reason why they have to bring it out and hold it up and look at it because they can't, they're like, like, what is this? Like, how did this happen? Like, why, who has that flag? I mean, I'm not taking anything away from the book. It's just an amazing moment to think that that is gonna be balled up and thrown through your window. And it, um, it shocks them, it shocks the audience, it shocks us. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's stunning when you break into the Capitol on January the 6th and you have Trump flags and Confederate flags and don't tread on me. And you, and like, I mean, I'm, I was looking at that fascinated, like, wow, that's a compelling thing that happens in America in January, on January the 6th. It's like, wow. It's like, what is that? So I think that's the reason why they hang it up and look at it because they're, they're, they're amazed at it. Like they're, they can't believe it. They can't believe it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Bethany comes with some reasons about what she could do with it or, you know, bury it or burn it. I got to remember the sequence of it. 
but yeah, it's uh, uh -huh. we got it. We got to look at it and deal with it. Yeah. Okay. Here's one for the artists. I wonder what the visual artists here feel their work would look like if they lived and created in 1953. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, for me, um, I don't think there would be much left of the photographs if I'm being honest. <laughs> Uh, since the the tears are representative of each racial experience that my family members have had, I think um, in the 50s, their experiences would be like 20-fold. There would be, it would probably be more gold leaf than, than photo grove. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other answers? Well, okay. at least today as stands, um present day black folks or non-black folks really um because i think a lot of black folks are able to resonate with sort of emotions and delivery and tone in the the piece that i did but at least with present day i think non-black folks already have an issue with um how digestible it is or how comfortable it makes them and i think had i created this during that era, then I would think that it would be far too <laughs> aggressive for many. I might not even, I might be unalived <laughs> for lack of better you know, words. I, but you know, the other thing about that question, John, is I do think like Jasmine's video work inside a black community is different than it being exposed to a mixed race community. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the, it's, it's because we did have isolated like we had different audiences. We didn't have an audience that allowed not not to go to the um you know the colored shows and the non-colored shows, but we had different audiences then. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's very different. Yeah. yeah. Um there's uh, more more coming in here. Um there was one about the stained glass window and just mentioned the flag being wrapped up in a stone and thrown through it. But the question just Professor Taylor, can you speak to the importance of the stained glass window? Thank you for sharing so much. It was a real gift. This is from oh. Leveron. Yeah, well, you know, the stained glass is, is a little, um, uh, uh, it's not gilding the lily. Like I think a lot of people think when they think stained glass, they think about religious spaces and churches. And, and it, I grew up in a house that had uh, two stained glass windows in the house. They were, it wasn't religious. I mean, my mother was a religious woman, but it was just part of the home. And and I've always imagined that when you get that um, shaft of light, and when we did it in DC, actually, the shaft of light that came through the stained glass window had like a religious iconography on it that changed um, from each of the eras. But the religious, the notion that it's a stained glass window um, gives uh, the, the nature of protection from the Lord in a Christian, Judeo-Christian way. And uh, the shattering of that shatters that tool of protection for them, for them, for the Bethany and Eugene. Mm -hmm. um, here's another one, uh, Ari Rubenstein. In part two of the play, Smith mentions to the couple that the house has a history. What specific history is he referring to? Is it the same house that was owned by Smith in act one? Yes, it is the same. It is the house owned by Smith in, in act one. And then Smith, um, you know, has a transactional mistake and it's the reason why he has to come back. But it is his house that was the most grand house and then Bethany and Eugene turn around and purchase it in the 50s and then it gets turned around and repurchased. So it is the same house, yeah. Okay, great. Here's one of Michael um, Najjar who helped put this together. So I wanna have, he's got a long question, but I wanna have him get his question. Dr. Taylor, your play is a great contrast to another Chicago set play, Clyburn Park. In that play, a black family purchases a house in Chicago and in the future it becomes a dilapidated home in a bad neighborhood. In your place, in your play, Bethany and Eugene's house becomes a high-end restaurant. Can you discuss how a play like Clyburn Park can become a so-called hallmark of American theater? He quote unquote, quote unquote hallmark. Um, or your play, which offers a better and more nuanced view of black history is seldom produced. Can you speak to the inequities in the American theater establishment and how plays that seem to denigrate the black experience receive all the honors while others that receive that celebrate black experience are overlooked. Um, that that's 
that is a long conversation. That is a very long conversation. <laughs> um, to, 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 and I, you know, I, I wrote an essay that's in the Mass Review that says, don't call uh, Black, African-American theater, Black theater, it's like calling a dog a cat. That starts to deal with this. Clyburn Park is a fantasy by a white author who did not read Raisin in the Sun clearly or particularly. Now, Bruce, the, the, the author, you know, most plays are fantasies by writers. So, you know, let it exist as it exists. The mistake is that people tie that to Raisin. And the reason why I say it's a fantasy, when I teach Raisin in the Sun and when I talk about Raisin in the Sun, Raisin in the Sun is not about a black family that moves into a white neighborhood. The reason being structurally, it's a three act play and the white guy, Lindner, shows up at the end of the second act. It is a play about does money make you a man? That's what Walter Lee is trying to, to suss out as he's dealing. And then he and his sister, Benita, who is dealing with the question of Yoruba culture, Africanity, where she exists in the world as a woman, as a proactive woman and her style and her thing. There's a series of things that happen. It is not about them going to Clybourne Park purely. Um, uh, to go to the question about why American theater operates the way it does um, and that my play is more nuanced. I mean, you know, I will give you the, I will give you the, this is a terrible anecdote, but it's a real anecdote. When I, I can't believe I'm going to do this story. When I went to talk to Martha Levy, who has passed away, Anna Shapiro, who is the uh, director of New Play Development, and Michelle Valansky, three white women, about personal history and whether or not Steppenwolf was going to do it was the day or the two days after the OJ verdict. And I went into Martha's office with my director, who's a, who was a black man. And Martha asked me, did OJ do it? Quite literally. She said, she asked me if OJ did it. And I said, I don't know. He didn't call me. I have no idea. And that was not the right answer to say. <laughs> and we had, a, we had a conversation about OJ. And when I left, I said to Donald, I said, we never talked about my play because what happens oftentimes with people who have the, they want their theater to affirm their existence. They don't want their theater to challenge their existence in any significant way. And what I'm trying to do perpetually is I'm trying to challenge thought, you know, all the time. So I think that that's where, I mean, you know, and a lot of my thought, I mean, my, the, the thing about this play, which is kind of interesting about personal history, is it's really not about white people. It's about a black guy and a black couple and their relationship. And so the white characters are part of their world, but they're not, it's not about them in so many ways. I mean, I think that, 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 that Clyburn Park is not a play that I like. I think it's, it's sad that that gets tied to Raisin and Sun. That's a very long answer. But I do think that the, to answer the question about the American theater, people go to theater to affirm their existence. And in that affirmation, it seems to be that it's, seen, it's a conscious denigration of, of black <sighs> intelligence. I mean, that's as simple as I can put it. Yeah, sad. Great, okay. Um, let's do maybe um, one more. One more question. Um, why is it important that Cosgrave be the first words and the last words of the play? Why, um, out of all the characters, did you choose Cosgrave to be the closer? Because he, he, he's the worker. I mean, at the beginning of the play, he's the, he's the person who is the uh, butler valet person. And then at the end, it is his restaurant. So he has moved his economic space from, you know, subservient to um, owning the, the, the restaurant. And so that's the reason why, I mean, it's, you know, whether or not he's progress or he's something else, but yeah, it's, it's very important that he start the play and he end the play because black labor is, is central to, uh, yeah, to understanding history, our history, our personal history. Yeah. Great. Um, we did get a question that, um, and then I'll turn things over to Dr. Coleman. Uh, for maybe a last word. Um, uh, Professor Taylor, any chance you'll come to Eugene for a performance? Yeah, I think I'm trying to. It's, it, I, I'm going to try to get my schedule to make it happen. I think we, mm -hmm. yes, I am going to try to get there. I don't know if it's been solidified, but I'd love to come out. And, and, oh, I think you got a lot of fans it. here. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to come see it. Yeah, it'll be great. Yeah.
So, Dr. Coleman. <laughs> um, I don't have a whole lot to say. Uh, I think uh, everything has been said. I, uh, I want to thank the, uh, I'd like to thank the people who planned this program this evening for us because uh, it's a very important conversation to have. And uh, thank you to the artists for your talents and what you have put forth and for your ideas that you are bringing to the community. Uh, I think it's very, very important because it makes us, uh, it makes us talk to each other. And I think as Professor Taylor says, you know, we all, we need to, we need to examine history and we need to think very uh, carefully about how we, how we navigate history. Uh, I think that's an important part of uh, not, well, I, I say solving the problems uh, that exist with racism. I, I don't know if we'll ever really solve those problems, but at least maybe we can learn how to uh, navigate and how to deal with those uh, problems. Um, I wanna thank also Dr. Taylor for uh, appearing with us and we sure, we welcome you back <laughs> to, we welcome you to the campus in January uh, to the play. We would love to hear uh, more of your lectures about history, especially African-American history. Uh, I, think, I think it's so important, you know, uh, we have all, and I, I went to school, I went to a, uh, a black school, black high school, and a lot of African-American history I never got because uh, we were not looking at ourselves uh, through our own eyes. We were looking at ourselves through the eyes of others, other races. And I think that's that double consciousness that exists in quite a bit of, of African-American literature and African-American art where we, uh, and I, I heard a lecture about this last night where we are, um, we, we definitely see uh, the, uh, we see ourselves through the majority race rather than through our own race. And so I, I think it's such an important conversation. Uh, thank you so much. And thanks to John and Michael Najjar and uh, Janet Rose uh, all of the people, Paul uh, Nordkist, uh, and to our actors who uh, also presented tonight. Thank, thanks to everybody. And uh, Dr. Taylor, we'll be working on this play. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I, I'd love, I'd love to come. I'd love to come out. Um, Malik, I saw you have a quick com. You had a comment in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think you hit it spot on uh, when when referring to us learning history and especially uh, Mr. Coleman as well was saying like, we don't get the opportunity to learn about ourselves and look through our own lenses through ourselves. So I, I think you guys hit it spot on, especially as I guess you could say like black artists or just black individuals aspiring and growing up. Like, I think the more that we take the time to learn about the history, we realize how important it is for us to do the work that we're doing. It's specifically, for someone that uh, was never familiar with Oregon and the more that I've become uh, more familiar with the history of the 1846 Black Exclusion Law and Oregon being one of the only free states in the US to know about that. And this is specific history that I've been doing research on and studying. So just to be a Black student here at U of O, I realize how important it is to continue to pursue our dreams and aspirations for people such as yourself and Mr. Stanley that have paved ways and we, we may not know the history and the background of what you guys done, but I do want to acknowledge that you are two individuals, even though I don't know you guys now, I, get, I want to get to know you guys over time to learn more about your history, but to know the importance of what it is of like, you guys have essentially paved the way along with the Alitas and the Fritz and the Jack Johnsons and those individuals that I specifically put in my artwork. Those are the reason, that's the reason why I did it because I was able to acknowledge the fact that 
these these people we're often looking up but they're often looking down on us to see if we're changing the narrative and they didn't do they didn't put all this work in for us to just normalize it and forget about it because that's how i see it when we don't acknowledge these things we're just normalizing that the fact that it happened and we just hoping that we can just look past it and things are going to change but if we don't take the time to learn and understand the past and we'll never know how to move and be able to live through our present and our future so i just that was kind of building up and i wanted to acknowledge and let you know that we're we're we're, we're working we're working right. thank you great yeah yeah well malik said all that, all that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Right, well, thank you, everybody. I think it's a good time to, to say good night. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Enjoy. Peace, people. We'll see you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Yes, you. Thank you.